Now, what comes to your mind when you hear the words social media? Now, I'm going to guess for many Westerners, you're probably starting to think of either Facebook, maybe Instagram, maybe Twitter. But of course, there's a new powerhouse to the social media scene, and that is TikTok, which garnered international success over the past 12 months and has also been in the spotlight as former President Donald Trump has proposed the idea of potentially banning TikTok in America simply because it is a Chinese social media company. Now, many people around the world are, of course, now familiar with TikTok, but few people know about the parent company, ByteDance, which was founded by one of China's brightest minds in the tech industry. ByteDance not only has TikTok, but it has a variety of different social media apps that I believe could potentially vault it into the number one position and potentially become the most valuable social media company in the world. In today's episode of Real Talk China, I'm very honored to bring in Matthew Brennan. He is a UK expat and one of the leading experts on Chinese tech, and he is also the recent author of Attention Factory, the story of TikTok and China's ByteDance. Everybody, welcome to episode three of Real Talk China. All right, everybody, I'm very happy to welcome into the studio Matthew Brennan. Matthew, thank you for joining us on Real Talk China. How are you today? Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, a pleasure to be here. Yes, uh, doing well. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Excellent. Now, I think some of the some of the guests actually saw we actually recorded this a few weeks ago, had some audio problems. So we're back for round two and we're going to make a good episode this time. So um, thank you again, Matthew, for making time out of your day to come join us here. And I'm really excited because you know, one of the biggest stories in 2020 was really obviously TikTok and how much they grew and expanded around the world. Obviously, most of the world in lockdown, uh, many parts still in lockdown. We're all looking for that entertainment on our on our cell phones. So we're going to be telling this story about um, TikTok. And I think what's really interesting is, is I want to tell our audience, you know, a little bit about how we met. Um, we met in September 2019. It was during the uh, China chat which is the largest English speaking, you know, WeChat conference in the world. You hosted that event. Fantastic. And I remember at that time, at that conference, you were, you told everybody that you were writing a book about WeChat and all of us, I know that is still in production, but I thought it was quite fascinating that you actually, um, you know, put that project on hold and started a whole new book. So that's really my first question where I want to begin. You know, what was it about, um, you know, TikTok and ByteDance that was so compelling that really inspired you to write this new book of yours? Um, I think I just, the biggest driver was the product itself, right? Yeah. Like I used the Chinese version of TikTok for several years, actually, since it first became big in uh, probably very early 2018. Yeah. And I, I just knew it was a special product. It was very compelling. It was very addictive. The content you saw on there, it was like no other uh, social platform or content platform. Yeah. It was the very first so Chinese social media platform where non-Chinese, you know, Lao Wai, foreigners yeah. actually really embraced it. And they were straight away becoming quite successful influencers were on there. I learned a lot of Chinese just by just by going through the product and, and using it every day. And yeah. so that was the biggest driver was that clearly this was um, a game changing product. Now, also at the conference, you know, I don't know if you remember uh, Sirius from being there, you know, even the audience were asking about the implications of the rise of ByteDance at the time. That's right. Um, when Tencent employees were on stage, you know, because the we're lucky enough to have several Tencent people come uh, when we do that conference um, That's right. because it's established and they recognize it now um, that they, you know, towards the end, they were getting some tough questions, to be honest, yeah. Uh, yeah, about absolutely. how, um, you know, ByteDance is rising up. What are you guys, you know, like they're the up and coming yeah, contenders and, and, and the Tencent uh, representatives had to remind people, you know, we're still number one, which is true. You know, in yeah. terms of time on mobile, uh, Tencent still is number one in China uh, by quite some way, actually. And, yeah. um, you know, people do forget that because they get carried away with the rise of, of, of Douyin and, and TikTok, which is, the, you know, the big new uh, thing going on. 
Um, right. But, you know, so it was, there was a couple of factors there. The writing was on the wall that this was the big new thing. And so I was to some degree, you know, uh, it was the obvious thing to write about when COVID hit and I knew my other book was on hold. Um, and then I, this was the product that was, you know, and there's another another reason actually, which was, you know, um, due to my personal reasons, I've got an old friend who was one of the earliest uh, TikTok uh, product managers. And so right. I'd been okay. speaking with him for years about the product and he's so Fantastic. passionate about it. And I've got all these insights from him uh, from just t talking casually, like nothing, yeah. uh, nothing to, uh, no secrets or anything, but like yeah, um, yeah. just uh, ways to think about the product and ways to think about um, what the company was doing. And so I felt like, wow, I have this really unique position where I, on the ground, I, I've used the product extensively and believe in it. And I've got this great contact who, you know, we had so many conversations uh, and I just started writing and it, right. it was going to be a small book. And then yeah. it turned, it was going to be a book, you know, just a actually it was going to be a chapter in a, in a, a lot in a book about several companies is what it was originally going to be. Okay. And, and then it, you know, it just kept writing. It was quite clearly that, you know, this was really, really interesting. And I, right. I just went with my passion for that. Well, I think we're, we're going to get into, you know, um, you know, I have some, some uh, feedback from some of the fans of the channel who have submitted questions. So we're going to get into this because some of them, you know, it's like, why is the algorithm so good? Why has it been so successful? We'll get into that later because I want to start a little bit first, actually, with uh, the founder, you know, uh, Tiang Yiming. You know, he's quite the entrepreneur. Um, and I think one of the things that was really interesting is, you know, the, the big draw for me as well is, you know, they were able to crack the code, right? I mean, they were the first real Chinese tech company to create a product that, um, you know, was completely adapted by the Western world. Um, and it's quite unique. And I think that really had a lot to do with the founder, um, again, his vision, you know, for the future. Instead of saying, let's create a Chinese tech company, which you know, which is great. Obviously, China is a fantastic market, you know, to, to compete domestically. You know, he had, let's do both, you know, let's have a much more of a global, you know, uh, viewpoint or vision for the future. So take us back to the early steps and know a little bit more about Jiang Yiming, the, the, you know, the founder yeah, sure. and, uh, you know, his story. Yeah, Jiang Yiming uh, is uh, the founder for those people who don't know. And um, yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you, sir. I think like uh, his, uh, the success of the company can be traced back to the founder and his attitude and i think of all of the founders the big famous names in tech in in china uh, yeah. he is one of the most western orientated in his philosophy and approach uh, towards internet services so you know he's he's a super impressive uh, character obviously his results speak for themselves but uh, yeah. humble beginnings because you know he he's not from um, anywhere where it's uh, he's not from he's from the countryside essentially um, okay. in Fujian province uh, which is opposite from Taiwan uh, it's a hacker Chinese mm -hmm. um, with um, you know came from a, a fairly not uh, his his father ran a factory eventually his father went off and, and opened a, a electronics factory and so that's where okay. the money came for them for him to go and study in Beijing and then afterwards uh, he the family was not rich but uh, after some you know coming start growing up in the countryside um, yeah. they were okay they were sort of middle class let's say gotcha. and um, he's uh, he studied computer science in Tianjin and then went off to work in the you know bustling and booming uh, startup scene of Beijing yeah. uh, where he did like many different startups and, and worked for Microsoft very briefly as well there. Uh, uh, before he started ByteDance. Uh, what, so what, was he, the comment he, that he, what was the comment that he made about his time at Microsoft? Didn't Yeah, he, so in Microsoft, he did work there for about, uh, for at least half a year, I believe. And okay. uh, he found it the most boring time of his entire career, is how yeah. he described it. Um, read a lot of books is all he, the only good thing he really had to say about it. Yeah. Um, he found himself idle for half the day. Uh, right. And that's simply because you know this guy's an entrepreneur. He's he's right. a he's a hustler, and yeah. um, he's got what he calls a special motivation. So uh, he he he's not a guy who wants to sit down all day and follow detailed processes and right. tick boxes and uh, dot i's and cross t's and things like that. Um, he's that's that you know for him that's uh, 
Yeah, you know, for having said that, you know, I, that um, Microsoft Research Asia in Beijing is very well respected. You know, I don't want to talk them down too much because oh uh, no, no, their, think, their alumni I, is, is very impressive. And, I think uh, I think it's more just the <laughs> the person, right? I mean, you know, for for instance, yeah, if you are that if, if you're that innovator and that entrepreneur, you know, yeah, it's yeah, hard yeah. to go. You're not going to go to Microsoft, right? Microsoft's a very established, you know, fantastic company, systems, processes. I mean, great career path to kind of work your way up the corporate ladder and do very well. And they do an amazing job all over the world. Uh, but right, if you are if you are that innovator like he is, I mean, for those of you that don't know, it's how you mean 2013 Forbes 30 under 30, 2018 top 40 under 40. Um, I think he's net worth around 22 billion US dollars right now, given the high valuation of uh, ByteDance and the success that he's had. And you know, only 37 years old, incredible, you know, incredible entrepreneur, visionary. And again, um, you know, we're, we're going to get into this, you know, this topic about, you know, what makes ByteDance um, such an amazing company. And I think, tell us a little bit more about the different companies involved. Because I think for most people in the West, for example, you know, we think of TikTok and we say, oh, it's owned by this Chinese company. It's called ByteDance. So they kind of almost think that ByteDance is a, you know, a, a one trick pony. It's like, okay, they have TikTok. But they actually have a tremendous amount of uh, different apps and and uh, you know companies and things. So tell us a little bit more about you know why this company is so valuable. It's not just TikTok, right? It's many no, things no, involved. No. I mean, even before they did Douyin, which was the original Chinese version of TikTok, even before that, they were already one of the largest internet companies in China, mm -hmm. and therefore, you know, by extension, one of the, one of the largest internet companies in the world already. Yeah. Um, although you know their non-China presence was 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 quite small, um, so the original flagship product is Totiao. Uh, Totiao is mm -hmm. a household name in China. Uh, mm -hmm. It's virtually non unknown outside China, but okay. we can say it's a news feed. It's a news aggregator, so it's a news feed full of articles and also video content now. And you can think of it as the Facebook news feed without the friends. That's really the easiest way to think about it. Good analogy. Yeah. And this was the original flagship that already took them to you know super unicorn valuations uh that was already got them you know well past the 100 million uh active user mark and already you know made them the one of the most important companies uh in china for for nice. internet services but uh and, and and this is where their their core technology came from which is yeah. what they're famous for the recommendation engine Okay. So uh, yeah, let's the get recommendation into engine is, is really their core competency and it's what they're famous for. And uh, that comes from Totiao because Totiao was um, is where they developed that. And Zhang Yimin was actually in the very earliest days of the company, uh, taught himself machine learning and uh, the techniques to build a recommendation engine. Because in 2012, when the company started, Actually, there was very, very few people in China who knew how to do that. It was a very right. new technology. It wasn't like today where there's AI conferences everywhere and right. everyone's talking about deep learning, machine learning, and it's rented the popular consciousness. Um, no, there, you know, back then uh, there wasn't this hype yet. Uh, it was just ha it was just breaking actually. There was just the, the early breakthroughs in the ImageNet uh, competition were happening uh, about six months after the company was founded, and so. They they got timing well there actually in terms of they they hit the wave of mobile because yeah. you know everything before 2010 in China was desktop basically right. in terms of right. internet services and uh, when iPhone 4s came out in 2011 it just completely exploded uh, and I don't remember back then there was all these queues outside the Apple stores and everyone right. was going crazy for the iPhone absolutely it was just a really a revolution, an absolute yeah. revolution in terms of access to information and access to services, and yeah. so that that they caught that road, that wave at the right time. Uh, they they got in like just shortly after that, uh, when you know there's the still the market's wide open, but yeah. they'd already you know they weren't starting from zero. This is Jung Min. He's already done four startups before this. Uh, exactly. He's already worked for Microsoft. He's already. I've got his network and his uh, VC contacts and etc. So this guy knows what he's doing, and and then they they moved into this area and he saw the opportunity, which was recommendation, and that's the opportunity today that's still driving TikTok is that that one insight from his uh, understanding of uh, how you know we can search for things online, 
Yeah. Uh, and we all know how powerful and important and useful search engines are. And right. that technology has been in the market for, you know, well over 20 years now to solve the problem that the internet's too big. Yeah, <laughs> you can't, uh, at one stage, it was small enough where you could just manually look through directories. Yeah, um, yeah. But very quickly that, you know, you can't do that. And, and today we have to rely on search engines. Whereas on the phone, uh, because we've got a very small screen, we've got fragmented time. <laughs> Sorry. I got a very small screen <laughs> and we got fragmented time yeah. uh, that the, actually rather than search where you have to type out terms and maybe you don't know even what you want to search for because you're right. looking for entertainment content or you're looking for news, right? Where you, you can't search for news. You don't know what, what's happened yet. Yeah, right? absolutely. Uh, you can search for generic terms like news, but you can't, no, nothing more than that really right. uh, because it, due to the nature and uh, and so recommendation is actually uh, makes more sense where instead of it's people looking for information now you're turning it on its head it's information looking for people you're yeah. you're based on their preferences and their behavior you learn and understand them and then you basically know what they like and what they don't like and yeah. you give them what they like well i think and and so it's really amazing because that that technology was really pioneered in totel and, and again, like, you know, like you said, pre 2010, everything's on desktop, everything is the users going to search for it. And, you know, it was amazing because now, like you just said, now you're on a mobile screen and, you know, people are constantly addicted to cell phones. That's the new thing. Everyone's got, you know, the power. I mean, you basically have a computer in your pocket now, you know, with these, sure. with these phones. And so, it, you know, now it's like, well, let's, let's turn it the other way around. Let's make content look for people. And now that concept is actually so similar on every platform, right? Instagram, Facebook, you know, YouTube, every internet company has AI algorithms. You know, I think every, every uh, internet company out there have the same goal, really. How do we engage and keep our users on the platform as long as possible? Right. And that's, exactly. I mean, it's just like search every app and platform you have uh, you use today has a search function. Correct. Right? Um, so it's not, it, it's been integrated everywhere. Um, but Google still has the best search, right? If you want to, yeah. if you want to, they've got the best technology around search and uh, they've honed those algorithms over you know, decades now uh, for all kinds of niche scenarios and long tail requests. But, ByteDance has done exactly the same the other way with recommendation engine. You know, everyone can do recommendation, but they do it best. Yeah, very good. Yeah, and I think so. That that's that's obviously um, you know the bread and butter of of what's made them so successful. And I want to talk a little bit more about uh, what I like to refer as these two ecosystems um, that exist. And I think this is something not a lot of people understand. And I believe this is really another reason why you know ByteDance has been so successful. For example, when you have Facebook, we just think of it as you know, one ecosystem, one network, um, you know, it is the Facebook network. So if you're in Germany or New Zealand or America, you know, you join into the Facebook network from your, you know, respective location and you're all inside that one ecosystem. And what ByteDance has done is they've actually made two ecosystems. So you've got, you know, obviously Douyin, which is the, you know, the mainland Chinese version of TikTok. Um, that is the original one that is, you know, really just in mainland China. Um, and then you have TikTok, which is more the international version. And so what's interesting is, is that a lot of people don't know this, you know, you can't find, you know, they're completely different ecosystems. So if you are on TikTok, you can't find a user on Byte, on uh, Douyin and vice versa. And I think this is quite interesting because, you know, for companies, for example, if you are Coca-Cola and you want to have an official account, you know, you'd be you needing to have, you know, um, two, obviously you need to have a Douyin account and you need to have a TikTok account um, as opposed to Facebook, you can just have one, you know, Facebook page. And I think this is interesting and this well, I wanted to get into this because obviously we now we're going to talk about TikTok in the US and, you know, how that's been successful. How, how did, you know, tell us a little bit more insights into, you know, uh, you know, how they could bring TikTok internationally and just, you know, was it really just the search engine that, that, that just was able to captivate it or, you know, how did they start that marketing where they're starting? All right, let's bring this TikTok and bring it all over the world now. Sure, sure. Well, you know, uh, doing a separate app is actually, it's uh, it's fairly common. You, you've got some case studies here, like uh, WeChat when a different, WeChat is actually separate, um, but not yeah. entirely. It's two separate networks that talk to each other. It's a little That's bit right. complicated to uh, <laughs> explain. People get confused. Um, but it is actually separate on a technical level. WeChat gotcha. and Waste In are separate right. products. But um, 
with uh, you know for games like Honor of Kings. Uh, that's another great example. Honor of Kings is the the most successful game in China in the last five years, uh, mm -hmm. at least in terms of revenue. And yeah. um, outside of China, it's uh, they completely rebranded it, and it's called Arena of Valor in most markets, and okay. it uses Batman and, and Superman instead of the Chinese characters. Gotcha. Um, so doing that doing that rebranding, it's actually very common for China. It's common for Russia as well. Those are two markets that uh, tend to rebrand products internationally. Um, okay. But uh, when they came to do Douyin and say, okay, well, Douyin by, as I alluded to earlier, by 2018, well, yeah, okay, 2018, uh, January was when it really broke out. But mm -hmm. even a couple of months before that, so Douyin is, is doing well, but yeah. it's not a huge mega hit yet. Yeah. But the company's already said, you know, we want to take this abroad. You know, we've already said this is working well enough yeah. uh, that we want to make an international version. So okay. really quite early on. Uh, it wasn't, they didn't wait for it to uh, be a, a huge success that everybody knows today. It was very early on in the product life cycle where they said, we want to do an international version. And they first took it to Japan and South Korea and okay. Vietnam and Thailand markets like that, Southeast Asian and East Asian markets. And later on, they took it to other Asia, you know, Indonesia, um, India eventually as well. So it was definitely Asia that they attacked first because, you know, geographically, yeah. uh, that kind of makes sense, right? Those are the countries right. closest uh, to China, uh, closest physically, and also closest culturally in terms of uh, places like Malaysia uh, have large uh, Chinese, uh, ethnically Chinese populations, For sure. and uh, there is some cultural similarities I feel uh, between these markets, especially in terms of the user habits. You know, they're mobile first markets like Correct. China uh, that skipped the web 1.0 and 2.0 eras essentially. So yeah. um, that's that's where they went first, and it turned out that actually, um, although they did take a very localized approach and worked with influencers directly in each market and tried to tailor the experience uh, for each of these markets, particularly in Japan, actually did the, people, a lot of people don't know, but the Japan app of TikTok is a separate app. Um, okay. It's got a separate app ID, and if you download it on the App Store, um, it's you know if you use the the Japanese version of the app and the and the American version, you actually have to have two apps on your on your Android phone. Uh, I think it works the same on iPhone. Uh, so but we're talking it, three egg ecosystems. So is there is there would, so if I had the Chinese, would I have Douyin, then TikTok U.S. version, TikTok Japan version? Would I is, would there be three? Uh, uh, you know, when you open the app, it's it's essentially the 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 content ecosystem is exactly the same. Gotcha. Um, yeah. It's just the, the two different app IDs uh, gotcha. is, 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 all, is all it re really is the difference. But it's an interesting like little uh, factoid yeah. <laughs> about yeah. how they uh, initially uh, rolled it out across across um, across these markets. Of course, later on, you know, when they integrated musically into TikTok as well, there was also the case of like integrating uh, these platforms together. And there were, I think, two different app IDs at one stage. But um, you know the the point here is they 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 were at this as you said earlier. There's not that many case studies of like a really successful uh, product in China doing very well yeah. outside China. Absolutely. And, and so, and some people were quite negative about it and saying, you know, this is probably not going to do very well. Most most of these uh, social or, or content products that work in China tend not to work outside China. That's and true. So uh, you know we don't we don't we don't want to be too. And not we're not too optimistic about this one. Um, on the other could, hand, I think a good reason. I yeah, I was just going to add. I, I, I was just going to add. I think one of the things that TikTok did really well is they they created a, a the international version. Is it, it's just so well produced and managed. It looks like it just comes from Silicon Valley, and I think that was interesting. As earlier, I saw a poll where you know when you know when there was a, you know started to get a little political, and Donald Trump wanted to ban TikTok. You know, um, you know there was something around 60, 70 percent of Americans you know didn't actually even know it was Chinese. You know, they had just assumed. Yeah, well, care, right? I mean, why should they? Why yeah. should they care where, where an app comes from? I mean, uh, the average girl on the street who just wants to watch some uh, meme videos and uh, have a bit of a laugh. Why, a why should he care if this app is from Japan or China or India or Silicon Valley? Um, yeah. It really shouldn't matter. So and, and, and most people don't don't care. Uh, and, and that's that's absolutely fine. Um, so with with this app. Uh, they they did localize it in terms of uh, content 
ecosystems in terms of it's a little bit different how it works today yep. um but certainly at the beginning uh each country was essentially an island uh, mm -hmm. in terms of content so if you're an indonesian user of, of tiktok you basically only saw content you were only recommended content from other indonesian users and right. the same for japan and the same for vietnam etc uh, and and there's pretty good reasons for that i mean language was a was a pretty big one right yeah, like absolutely. you don't want to Vietnamese language content when you when you can't understand it because you're Thai. Uh, so, but um, actually, what they found is over time that they actually these barriers, these islands started to talk more, and they actually started importing content from different places. And right. now it's become much more much more global, um, especially with the American content because Amer globally American culture still is you know a dominant in many yeah. respects and so uh when when american when it started to become popular in america you know that content started to be successful in many markets uh, depending on the category right so stuff that's more joke orientated again it's still got the language barrier uh but yeah. sort of more physical stuff or sport um or or, or you know makeup etc cosmetics things like that so or arts and crafts you know this stuff can uh, this stuff, stuff can work anywhere uh yeah. so there is, there's all these sort of nuances about how they did it. I mean, uh, we can really go quite deeply into that in the book, actually. Nice, nice, excellent. Um, Matthew, now, uh, this is an interesting time of year. We are just, um, you know, about a week away from Chinese New Year, you know, uh, 2021. And I want to actually go back. I, I know I, I was listening to um, a Chinese t uh, podcast about a year ago talking about uh, – actually Chinese New Year 2020 and how that was really a very big movement for ByteDance and how they were able to acquire a lot of new users. We'll talk about what's happening in 2021, but for um, I, I want to share this story with our audience here in 2020. Uh, now, this was just right before, obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic started. What was quite interesting is, is that uh, ByteDance, they actually saw an opportunity um, to actually start live streaming, or not live streaming, but broadcasting a movie. And they bought the rights to a movie called uh, Lost in Russia. And this was, uh, I think they had paid, you know, over 100 million US dollars, you know, for the rights to, you know, basically, you know, have to be able to stream this content, you know, on their platform. And it was actually the third part in a series. I think the first one was Lost in Thailand, Lost in Hong Kong. This was the third part installment in this uh, comedy series called Lost in Russia. You know, they had paid, uh, you know, $100 million for this. And then they made it free to all the bite, you know, to the bite dance users. And I think what's interesting is, is that you know what we see in Chinese, you know, tech companies, for example, during Chinese New Year, um, you know, it's common to give away, you know, the hongbaos, the red pockets, you know, full of money, or to give away things. But at the yeah. time, 2020, it was quite interesting because it was like um, I have this quote that I'm going to bring up here. Um, let's see where where was it. Um, they said, giving out cash is yesterday's news, but releasing a major new movie for free? Now that's interesting. <laughs> and I think that's, and it was quite interesting because right after that, you know, obviously COVID hit, everybody's stuck at home. You know, you've got this now, this movie that's streaming on there. So that was really, you know, quite a unique event, you know, for them to really gain a lot of um, new users. Um, can you make some comments about, um, you know, how, how they are able to do these promotional campaigns and kind of some of their marketing and, and how they're, they're growing in that regard? Yeah, I think that that opportunity arose because of COVID. Um, yeah. If I remember correctly, you know the the, the movie was going to be released, and then uh, cinemas all got shut down over the over the over the entire country, uh, yeah. pretty much, you know, overnight. And yeah. they were stuck with like, oh damn, what do we do? We need to right. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have a complete wipeout in terms of the box office take on this movie yeah. and so the uh, developers uh, so the the publishers of that of that uh, movie that's why they were able to cut that deal yeah. a sort of opportunistic move i guess from uh, from bike dance to do that um, but it does make a lot of sense i mean in terms of bike dance content on on platforms like tiktok and douyin uh, it's quite clear you know they've been making the videos longer and longer and longer yeah uh, you're able to start with 15 seconds and then gradually roll it out to you know uh, half a minute or a minute or even three minutes or five minutes yeah. uh, in china some of you know you can click on some of the videos and they just go into a full-length video sometimes they might right. link out to sigua um, or another bite dance platform 
and you've just got a full length video. So taking it to two hour movies is a little bit extreme. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, you know, you would never expect if you go back to the early days of Musical.ly or, or the very, very beginnings of Douyin that this platform would be hosting movies. I don't think anyone would believe you, but <laughs> they did it. Uh, and uh, I think they will probably end up doing it again um, because uh, TikTok is a, and Douyin are, are video first platforms, but I don't think that they view themselves as being restricted by the short video uh, label. Correct. And uh, that this can be a platform for all kinds of video content and live stream content, just all kinds of interactivity content where the, uh, it makes sense for them to recommend it to you because they know you so well. And that's, you know, playing to their strengths right. uh, in terms of having a very deep you know, profile of you and understanding what, you know, what you're likely to want to watch. So right. um, that's, you know, it, 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 I said it was op opportunistic, uh, definitely. But, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and not usually how things work out. Um, but uh, I did. I do remember it. I watched the video. I didn't think the movie was very good, to be honest. I yeah. Watch it. <laughs> but, um, but like like you said, it, it is a successful franchise, and so people knew it. Um, and they put it across all of their platforms, I believe. That's it right. wasn't they just did. Uh, TikTok. They it did was. Sigua, it was uh, Huashan and all of the other ones that they have. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, Sigua is uh, watermelon and then Huashan is volcano. Those are two other platforms that are, you know, managed by ByteDance, owned by ByteDance. And, and obviously, Totiao, yeah. you know, Douyin. It actually right? speaks to your point, Cyrus, earlier, yeah. which is, you know, like uh, ByteDance is not just these three. Uh, I, I sort of misled people there, actually, <laughs> incidentally. It's not just three products. You know, yeah. In China, they have 50 different apps you know that's there's right. all kinds of things and you've never heard of half of them that's um, right and that's why some people call them the app factory uh, in Correct. china is one of the nicknames that they have and i think i think also you know just to go back to that as well matthew you we brought up a good point is you know when we're talking about an entrepreneur and success stories i, I think it wasn't wasn't uh, didn't you tell me that in the beginning they were developing many apps in the beginning right i think the first 12 months of the company they made something like 12 apps and it's almost kind of a good lesson in entrepreneurship that, you know, you're going to fail more, right? You know, you're going to fail, you know, let's, let's keep putting out good product, um, you know, and just trying to find our way. And then obviously, when we find a winner, you know, um, you know, obviously, in Douyin and TikTok, that really took off well, Totiao did well, I mean, other Siguas doing well, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, you know, just kind of a good entrepreneurial lesson there, I think, as well, you know, they've probably developed hundreds of apps, you know, in order to be able to find, you know, a handful that really achieve very big success in China and, you know, the international market. Definitely. The the idea of experimentation mm -hmm. and a factory production line of apps and uh, testing and seeing what works and quickly uh, iterating and pivoting uh, to in different directions uh, is has been there since the very beginnings of the company. And actually, in, in the book, we, we we actually link it back to his previous company, which is called 99Fung, which is a real estate platform uh, yeah. where they actually already were building multiple apps, even before they started ByteDance. Okay. Uh, this sort of philosophy and techniques, tactics uh, were already being, you know, had formulated in, in the founder's mind as being effective and appropriate for, for developing mobile apps. Very good. Now, Matthew, I want to segment segue into a little bit more, um, let's say, intense questions, if you will, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, I want to talk. I've got a lot of feedback from from users. I asked a lot of uh, the audience, you know, what questions would you like to ask, and you know, they're very interested in in the you know the political side. You know, for example, obviously Donald Trump last year, you know, had come out and said we're going to ban TikTok at, on the grounds of it is a national security threat to America. You know, what what was really the you know, the response from ByteDance and Beijing and, and what, what, I mean, what was their attitude or their feelings towards this potential ban? And, you know, obviously the United States is a huge market for TikTok. Um, and I want to just kind of get their feeling, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the feelings towards Donald Trump and this, you know, the, the you know, the moves from the United States government, if you can. I, mean, I can't speak for ByteDance, but it's quite clear what was, you know, it was going on. It was, uh, Trump sort of leveraging the situation for his own political ends. Yeah. And uh, that period has now passed uh, mm -hmm. and we're to a new administration. Uh, I think ByteDance would reacted how you would expect pretty much any internet company to react. You know, they really want to stay in the market. 
It's a it's the outside of China the most important market to be in if you're an internet company. For sure. Uh, and so they pretty much did everything they could to stay in the market and satisfy uh, the conditions that were arguably quite unfairly being placed on them. Right. Uh, you know they did push back. They did count. They did sue. Uh, I think uh, or, or played some legal. Uh, I, I can't remember the exact terminology, some of it, right. <laughs> but they, they, they did, they, they put out some, they pushed back against what Trump was doing legally um, yeah. in, in the States uh, and to the extent that they could within the boundaries of the law. Uh, and I think they played it well, I believe, because um, at one stage it really was looking quite grim uh, right. for them. They, they actually, it's an interesting case study because now I would expect that probably there won't ever be, at least in, in, in the near future or the foreseeable future, uh, even if there is another successful breakout from China of the same degree as TikTok, uh, it probably won't be allowed into the American market given the current political climate. Uh, yeah. And anything before this era, uh, people didn't even really think about this that much. You know, there was uh, no, there was none of this discussion around, oh, if it's a Chinese app, then it's a threat to us right. nobody really had this idea in their head at that much so it was only because they the timing here was very special correct and uh you won't really see this situation happen again i feel so i have you know really they, they were just in the middle of this shift i think they've just um they've just done enough is my gut feeling and we'll have okay. to see because there's still news out you know the story is not finished and yeah. there will be there will be uh you know more to come in terms of it does seem that they have committed to in breaking off uh, TikTok somehow into a separate company, and right. that might it might, might involve Oracle, that might involve Walmart, uh, it may involve a, another party we don't know yet. Right. Uh, but something's gonna something's still gonna happen there. So uh, we we you know we'll have to see. Yeah, I thought I thought the interesting thing was is I, I think TikTok handled it the best way that they could, or you know, ByteDance rather, you know, that saying, look, you know, we want to be in the American market. We're willing to work with, you know, maybe it is a, an Oracle or a Walmart. Maybe we split off. Maybe we own part of that business. You know, we're going to file some legal, you know, uh, you know, uh, some lawsuits, you know, to kind of protect our end. But you know, essentially, you know, we want to be in the American market. It, you know, our Americans do. And there's a lot of creators on TikTok in America. You know, that are creating great content and are you know, making good exactly. money. With that, that is a point. That's a great point, Cyrus, because yeah. like uh, it's too late almost for them to ban TikTok without causing mass outrage amongst yep. all of the people who love the product and especially all of the people who invested time in creating content for TikTok. Uh, it really would be an unpopular move uh, with such a large number of people in the market that I think uh, politicians would think twice about taking such a drastic measure now. Yeah, I actually saw a tweet up about that where somebody had said, you know, if you really want to send a message to the younger Americans, you know, that would be, you know, forget all these speeches and these politics. I mean, you know, if you were to take away their TikTok, you know, that would be a huge, um, you know, message, but not necessarily a good one. I mean, that would be a very bad message. And, I, and again, I think we're too late on that. I, that's interesting, though, that you said, um, and I agree with you, you know, I think it's going to be very difficult for another, let's say, Chinese company, you know, if they were to produce a product and now enter in America, it might be difficult, but it's, de it's definitely, definitely too, um, too late, you know, for TikTok. They need to find a way. It looks like they're going to do that. I mean, I think it is become such a big part of our, you know, experience on the internet, you know, certainly in America. And I think, again, because of, you know, what we've seen, they've really changed a lot of how the internet works. You know, I think, you know, um, for example, uh, Instagram, you know, they, you know, started producing their reels, which is, you know, their version of the TikTok, you know, uh, experience. And, and I think as well as it's, um, whoever's the first mover obviously dominates that. So, you know, I, I remember first seeing the reels and it's, you know, on Instagram and it's like, well, you know, it's just not that clean of a concept and version. You'll, maybe we'll get used to it, but again, the first mover is always going to have the advantage in that. Yeah, sure. I mean, Reels will have its place in the market, I'm sure. And yeah. they will have a certain size of market share in this uh, content format. But uh, it will be, they will be playing second fiddle to ByteDance, I'm sure. I, I, I would find it difficult to think of a scenario beyond some sort of legal uh, action. If it's just pure competition between Facebook and ByteDance over this particular market, 
I don't see any scenario where Facebook's going to dominate because the first mover advantage is so strong. Uh, yeah. in, in, and uh, ByteDance know what they're doing. Uh, they're, they're, they're a very capable company, so I don't see them making a misstep. Nice. Um, but having said that, you know, internet services is very volatile. So, uh, you know, stranger things have happened, but I, feel, I think it's a small risk. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what some people call, you know, um, by Dan's maybe biggest competitor or Douyin's biggest competitor in mainland China is Kuaishou, who is also getting ready to uh, IPO. And I think from what I understand, uh, Douyin is a little bit more popular on your bigger tier cities, your first and second tier cities, where Kuaishou is a little bit more popular in your rural cities, your you know third, fourth, and fifth tier cities. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, this rivalry, if that's the right word to say it, you know, talk a little bit about Kuaishou and Douyin? Um, it's a rivalry. I mean, you're right to point that out. Yeah, that's an accurate description. Um, okay. Yeah, so it's a little bit difficult to talk to, about Kuaishou to non-Chinese people because there's no direct equivalent in the West. Okay. Uh, there is an app called Likey, which is popular in many markets around the world, but uh, it's still an app that most people are unfamiliar with. And okay. so the core difference is one that... Um, Kuaishou is a short video experience that mm -hmm. is more social centric, uh, much more like a social network. And okay. the monetization model is based more around live stream and gifting and e-commerce uh, rather than advertisement, which is the primary, primary driver uh, for all of ByteDance's uh, products. Um, so there, there's, those are the fundamental differences, uh, mm -hmm. but really getting down and understanding uh, the product and, and what is it and why people use it is a little bit difficult, actually, uh, if you don't use it yourself. I still struggle with it because I feel that yeah. why show is a product that I don't particularly enjoy using. Uh, okay. I, I, I'm not, uh, I've, I've used it for God, tens of hours, I guess, over a couple of years now and uh, yeah. just plugging away, trying to get like why people use this. Yeah, I find yeah. the content extremely boring and uh, I, I don't get why it's been such so successful from a product perspective. And I've yet to hear anyone explain it to me. Uh, yeah. And I've read a ton of reports about it and, and spoken to people, and I still don't get it. So, yeah, um, no, no, that's interesting. I think, you know, I think and that's not that's not to say that it's fake or anything. And like, it's just to say that you know, I some I, I'm just being honest. You know, I feel like it's oh. not suitable for. Uh, uh, it's a little bit of a mystery to me why why it's so successful. Well, I think it's. I think it, you, you've hit it on the good point of what that is. Is that it? It very much is successful in these third, fourth, fifth tier cities where it is a little bit more about community. And I was watching. I read a case study about how um, these farmers, you know, were using Kuaisho, you know, really to sell these oranges in China. And you know, I think that that was you know very successful more on the Kuaisho platform than Douyin specifically. Where again, it's like you mentioned, it's a little bit more based on live streaming, certainly more community. And so I think that. You know, if you're in a fifth tier city, you know, you're, you know, almost localizing your content and engaging there. So it just kind of shows you how unique I think the Chinese internet scene is where, you know, you can have, I mean, there's, you know, obviously hundreds of companies. There's so many different things being made in products, um, uh, but also China is such a huge market, you know this can compete it almost has its own little niche you know for the say let's say the third you know the third fourth and fifth tier cities and you know their preferred social network one of the interesting things around kuaisho is that it's actually the oldest short video platform in china and maybe in the world uh, okay. it's uh, it's 2011 they started and okay. it started so early that it was no, uh, originally known as Kuaishou GIF. It was a platform for, uh, for sharing GIFs, not videos, originally. So okay. um, it's a really early mover. Okay. And uh, yeah, so they, they, did, they, they did pioneer this market to some extent. I think that's we do need to give them credit, credit for that. Um, and you're totally right to point out that, uh, you know, the core user base here is uh, people in these lower tier cities. And they're you know, they are very um, video centric, I think, is, is, is okay. uh, the way I would describe it in terms of even their usage of WeChat. These are the type of people who love doing long video calls with their families yeah, and yeah. With, uh, with their friends rather than messaging or typing. They just right. rather would just tap that button and immediately see the person. That, nice. That's always their preference. Okay. Uh, and so 
there's something there, I think, around that's a, that. That's a good cultural insight. That's a good cultural insight as we see China obviously so diverse with its, you know, 1.4 billion people and their internet tendencies and stuff. So there's a place in the market for it. Um, you know, I think both platforms will continue to do well in the future. Uh, Matthew, we're, we're going we're going to um, wrap it up with just now some some uh, questions from the audience here. You know that I've been able to gather. That's oh, right. So, um, first question: Why did um, how did Douyin and TikTok develop their algorithms to make them so much better at finding someone's niche community than other apps? Okay, so on TikTok, you basically have two options: you yeah. watch the video or you swipe up. Mm -hmm. And if you watch the video, you like it. And if you swipe up, you don't. So if and if you like it, you watch it 15 minutes and then you get on to the next one. So yeah. in you know a 15 second video, uh, you can watch like four of those in a minute. But the average time you spend on on because some of them you just swipe up after one second or two seconds. Yeah. So in a, in a minute, you're watching maybe five or six videos. Yeah. You put that over 45 minutes, you've got hundreds of videos that you're watching. Yeah. And you're giving very strong indicators of interest or dislike for each one of them. Mm -hmm. That is training the algorithm. So over a 45-minute session, you have trained the algorithm with hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of data. Oh, wow. Right? Take the same 45 minutes and think about Netflix. Yeah. You would select one episode of, of a show that you like, and you would watch that for 45 minutes, and you would not touch the screen. You would simply passively consume the content and and Netflix learns nothing about you, yeah. right? And then in the middle, put YouTube. And in mm -hmm. 45 minutes on YouTube, you you maybe might watch 10 videos, let's say. And so YouTube is learning 10 data points about you. So that's the difference, is that in the same period of time, you're giving Netflix one data point, uh, YouTube 10, and TikTok 200 different nice. points for them to train their algorithms. That's, you know... Uh, an oh, order of magnitude of more data. And so nice. that's why they're able to be so fast and so effective in learning your preferences. Fantastic. Great answer. That was awesome. Um, how about as far as um, next question, will it become the number one in terms of download and revenue generation? Uh, sorry, say again, it cut out. No problem. Um, will TikTok or, or Douyin become the number one app in terms of download and revenue generation? I think it already is in terms of download. Uh, yeah. It's been number one downloaded app in the world for almost two years, I think now, quite okay. well over a year. And yeah. uh, in terms of revenue, I think it's well up there in the charts as well. I think it might be number one, one number two, uh, if I, but it, it's up there for sure. Yeah. I, I did see some charts from App Annie, I think it was uh, a couple of weeks ago. So um, yeah, it's very likely. I mean, they've got, they've got the gifting and the e-com. Once the e-commerce starts in there and, and, the, uh, and the virtual gifting, yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Next question. Um, how would you address the concern that TikTok is even more invasive than most other apps in mining a user's phone data? A TikTok is invasive. Mm -hmm. I'm not. You know, I'm not going <laughs> to. That's that's the undeniable in terms yeah. of the data it takes. But uh, I believe it is. Uh, so is Instagram, and so is Facebook, and and so is uh, many other apps that you probably use on a daily may use on a daily basis. Yeah. And so uh, they don't do anything special today, at least. Uh, uh, you know, they, they're constantly iterating and new things. So at some point, there may have been some difference. Um, but at least in the recent, uh, you know, let's say half year, uh, when this question started to come up a lot on, on yeah. social media, uh, originally there was someone who's who uh, a specialist who said, "Oh, it's awful. It's uh, you know, you got to delete this app." But then uh, later, when journalists went to other specialists. Uh, people, they, they they came up with a much less newsworthy and uncontroversial answer that yeah. it's basically the same as what Facebook does. And so, yes, Absolutely. you probably should be worried. I mean, that there is a case over um, all of these apps and whether you should be using them. I think you want to do, for, as individuals, you want to educate yourself and think yeah. about that. I would strongly recommend everyone does that. Um, but uh, there's nothing special really about TikTok. Yeah, I think I think honestly that the, that's you've hit on a good point there, and I think we mentioned that earlier in the show is the fact that every social media network or internet company they all have the same goal: it's to keep you as engaged and on that platform as long as possible. So they're going to be you know running the algorithms, the AI, you know, get, getting as much information on you as possible to help them achieve that goal of keeping you on the platform. So I don't think I agree with you. I don't think it's a TikTok specific. 
Facebook, Instagram, you know, YouTube, everybody's doing it because then it's big money, right? I mean, we're, you know, we're selling ads We're you know, we're, we want people on these platforms as long as possible. So I agree with you. I mean, I, I personally, I don't think it's as bad as people make it out. I mean, certainly these, uh, the concept that these platforms sell your data is just not true. Um, yeah. and, uh, it's a misleading statement. And then the, uh, the, the business model does actually help small and medium sized enterprises greatly, I believe. Um, and you know what face Facebook's made this point recently. Um, but it, but it is a, a legitimate point, uh, as a businessman, you know, as, as running small and medium sized enterprises, uh, I'm, I'm quite amazed by the tools uh, that they have on Facebook and, 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 and Western platforms and what Google has uh, is much more developed than what's in China for targeting. Uh, yeah. And it can really, uh, you know, you can really, uh, there's so many opportunities even today uh, to grow businesses and target users um, on a very, very granular level, uh, which enables small businesses to flourish. Uh, if you cut this out, as, as Apple's trying to do, it really will end up hurting a lot of, uh, you know, small guys. It's not the big, not the big brands. The big brands are brand advertisers, right? If you're a brand advertiser, if you're uh, Coca-Cola, right? Like yeah. you don't need niche advertising, right? You yeah, just, you right. want to, you want to hit as many people as possible, uh, right. for, you know, a lower price as possible per person. Uh, and usually television does that, you know, the Super Bowl ads do that. Um, but, you know, small businesses, they, these tools like this actually really, really do help them. And so that, you know, that is a, a point that we do need to think about. Fantastic. Um, being the first Chinese app with a huge success around the world, what impact does TikTok ByteDance have on other Chinese internet technology companies? Um, yeah, it has a big impact. I mean, it's the only major internet company that's uh, got huge user base in China and globally. It's the only yeah. one. And so that puts them in a very unique position uh, where they can run arbitrage between these two uh, ecosystems, these two worlds. Uh, where they can take ideas and concepts and techniques and tactics and strategies from China and throw them out internationally faster and more effectively probably than any other company and vice versa. They can learn from the international markets internally, take those learnings and apply them back to the home market. Uh, right. And uh, so that's, 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 that has the potential to be really powerful. I agree. Now yeah. at the moment they are um, internationally basically just TikTok. They've actually shut down most of their international apps, the smaller ones, to focus just on TikTok. And I believe that strategy is because um, they are a little bit concerned right now. They've got high political risk, uh, they've got high regulatory risk. And right. so they don't really want to operate these smaller platforms at the moment. It's just not worth their while. Uh, why would you? Because they're also content platforms. And content platforms are always things crop up, uh, you know, the content means there's people involved and it gets messy and there's something, you know, something happens with children on one of the platform and, uh, oh, no, something yeah. there's all headlines written. So for, for them, it doesn't make any sense right now why it's such a high level of risk to do that. But once I think they've stabilized and maybe after, like I alluded to before, that TikTok breaks off as a separate company or, or partially owned or whatever they do, yeah. Um, that they're actually, you know, going to do what every Chinese company does, which is start offering a wide variety of internet services. Uh, something exactly what Google, sorry, exactly what Tencent does, exactly what uh, Alibaba does, exactly what Baidu uh, does in in the home market, and so be a bit more like Google, perhaps, where you know Google right. has Search as a flagship, you know, uh, cash cow, uh, yeah. but Google also does Gmail. You know, they right. also do Maps. They, they do a ton of stuff. They do absolutely. All right, last question. Um, Facebook currently valued at around seven hundred and fifty billion dollars. Um, ByteDance, roughly, we don't know because it's not publicly listed. It still is, you know, one of the largest privately held internet companies in the world. Probably is the most uh, valued, but that's valued roughly around one hundred million. Ten years from now, who has the bigger valuation? Who's the bigger company, Facebook or ByteDance? Uh, ten years from now. Ooh, hard to say. I'd say five years. Uh, say five years. Five years, even that. I mean, like, I think there's, uh, there's. It depends what Facebook is. It, I think the big question for Facebook, if if you're going to talk about ten year valuation, I think for me, it's like, do their bets in uh, virtual reality and uh, mixed reality uh, and augmented reality pay off? Because right. they have, you know, they've they're clearly that's one of the big. I think for them. That's what they're betting on being the next platform beyond right. mobile. Right. And that is a long-term bet. Uh, 
they've uh, they they've even stated that i think they've told shareholders that because actually it's quite interesting you know facebook is a much less scary company in terms of comp competition uh than something like apple or google because right. apple and google actually own uh, on the phone at least they own distribution right google okay. has google play and apple has the app store so they're right. actually sitting on a layer below all of these apps where and Facebook is just, uh, you know, it's just a series of services that sit on top. And so gotcha. they're in a vulnerable position. And so, so is ByteDance actually in that respect. All, most of the, well, Tencent's yeah. the same and Alibaba's the same. Um, so they, they got this long-term worry always that they don't own the platform. Right? They're always, yeah. they're working in someone else's garden. And, if, and like, Very like what Apple has insight. done recently to them, which is, you know, said, okay, you can't take this, you can't, you know, you can't target users in this way, and you can't get, you need, if, there's going to be a pop up now uh, to let all of our users know that you, you're getting this data, and they have to ask it. That really hampers their business. Uh, there's nothing they could do, right? So um, yeah. they want to own, they want to own the platform, and if that bet pays off, they'll be, you know, they could be another Apple in terms of valuation or even more. Uh, for for ByteDance, um, even today, you know that 100 million valuation that you just mentioned, you know that's uh, the, the valuations that I, I would guess more like 300 million now. To be yeah. honest, given how the markets have gone this year and the crazy, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's just nuts. And you can see with the IPO valuation of Kwaisho now, you know how investors are going crazy for Kwaisho, and Kwaisho is nowhere near, nowhere yeah. near any the other ByteDance in terms of like. The the when that comes out, it is going to be it's going to be crazy. I mean, uh, you thought so. that and and financial was was oversubscribed and and hyped up, and it was. Yeah. Uh, but bite dance will be more. I, I, think so. I can't see I can't see anything else. It's, this is going to be one of the biggest IPOs uh, of any tech company. Um, you know, it might subside, It might even uh, be bigger than the uh, Alibaba one. Yeah, I think it. I think it has the potential to be the biggest IPO in the world for sure. I, I, I think it, it has that potential. We'll see how it how it goes. Um, Matthew, that's all the questions today. I want to thank you so much for coming on Real Talk China. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed your insights. Again, you're one of the brightest minds in Chinese tech industry. Um, you know, you've done some amazing work. I look forward to continue watching. Um, you know, your work that you're doing. So everybody, um, we're going to put a link down in the description below where you can check out on Amazon Matthew's book um, about TikTok. I'm, we're very excited as well, myself as a big user of WeChat. I look forward, to, you know, to reading the WeChat book as well when that project is finished. Um, Matthew, thank you again for coming on the show. Serious. Thank you for inviting me. A pleasure. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us today and we'll see you in uh, the next episode of Real Talk China. Thank you.